How's it going, everyone? And welcome to episode two of Devs on the Rock, brought to you by the game developers of Newfoundland and Labrador. Today, we're going to visit Sassy Tuna Studio with the creative artist and designer, Julie Lewis. And we're also going to meet up with John Lamb of John Lamb Illustration and senior artist at Other Ocean Interactive. So let's head downtown and visit Sassy Tuna Studio. Hi folks, we're down here at Sassy Tuna Studio, downtown St. John's, and we're here with Julie Lewis, the founder. Uh, thanks for being on the show and welcoming us into your studio. Thank you very much. We're here on a busy Saturday, so I hope we have a few things uh, that we can chat and show off. Excellent. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about what Sassy Tuna is? Uh, Sassy Tuna, uh, the name in particular, uh, is a British nickname for somebody who likes to party. Uh, my maiden name was Waylon, so the entire origin came from a little logo I used to draw when I was in art school in Ottawa. The whale logo turned into a tuna, so it really evolved from there. Uh, I started teaching in 2003, and then when I moved here to Newfoundland in end of 2004, uh, I started teaching classes and the Sassy Tuna name just continued and when I purchased SassyTuna.com uh, it was only me and cat food if you type Sassy Tuna into the Google engine. Uh, so we really only started with about four students uh, and we'd, we've had upwards of 130 students now over the years uh, coming and going in a week. So between the, the digital art, the animation, the video game creation, and the uh, traditional visual art, uh, Sassy Tuna covers a, a range of things. So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, I have That's to say. excellent and a great learning experience, a creative learning experience for, for young folks. Um, but none of this would have happened without some of your creative background as an artist, as a, as a designer. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the journey of Julie Lewis uh, up until Sassy Tuna came to be? Sure, well I went to a number of, of colleges in Ontario but when I moved back here in particular uh, the economy was in a weird state. Uh, even the word animator didn't really exist. Uh, nobody knew what to do with me when it came to creative roles because I wasn't technically a graphic designer. Uh, so I found myself in a funny juncture of I need to create but where do I fit into things? So I said okay if I can't fit into anything I'm gonna make something that will become a fit for anybody who is working alongside and with me. Um, so really the first year of Sassy Tuna was mobile. I never really had any uh, space to go. Uh, so I ended up doing caricatures. So I would go around to events and parties and I went to Twillingate and Gander and all kinds of places kind of with a mobile sp space. And that was what we ended up, or I say we because my brother worked with me early on. So he was the digital wing and I was kind of the traditional wing. So the first $10,000 the Sassy Tuna made, if you divide that by $12, that's where that money came from. So there are no shortcuts when it comes to visual art. There are no shortcuts when it comes to building a reputation and a name and, and even a joy. So there are a lot of people that I got to know one-on-one -on -one for a $12 portrait at a time. And really that evolved from doing caricatures at Canada's Wonderland when I was in Ontario. So it was a funny, funny journey to, to get to that point, yeah. And, and you're still practicing, even though you're busy with Sassy Tuna, there's a nice com a community vibe here, uh, you're still out there doing some of your, your own artwork, uh, some community uh, artwork and creative things through Sassy Tuna as well. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those those extra outside of the studio events going on? Yeah, uh, I was really happy to connect with Business and Arts NL they were really the ones that um, had championed the piano painting program. So um, it's, it's a really nice thing for anyone who is teaching art to actually be actively out working at their trade. Um, so the piano project was really my evolution beginning to start really getting into the kind of the expression of getting out in the community as opposed to what's going on behind closed doors. Uh, I did the mural of the Great Fire of 1892 up on McBride's Hill, so that was three stories high. My particular pride in that one was that it, um, it was an estimate, and this is the business side of me that came in for this, I estimated 286 hours uh, for completion. I actually calculated square meter how long I thought everything would take. 
And in the end, I, I finished it in 275 hours. So for me, that was a personal win because you have a calculation of what your production is going to be. And I, I took personal pride in that because I really wanted to know resource-wise how that works. And I think it's important for the children even to know when you're teaching, this is what goes into it. There are stages of the game. There are parts you're going to be frustrated with. There are parts you just have to go with. There are parts you do have to quantify because we're all free thinking when we're in the arts world, the arts realm. But there is a practical side to it where positive confidence comes from that too because you notice movement and you notice change. You're teaching this multidisciplinary field uh, to young people. How important do you feel that is to our community, to the creativity of our young folks? Uh, it's, I'm realizing now how important it is. As I said, Sassy Tuna started early on by something that was expressive because I didn't see anything like it. Now, when it comes to design thinking and being able to think out of the box and looking at where leadership qualities come from, they don't come from following the letter of the law the way that things can be. You know, uh, not all 20 students in a class are going to think exactly the same way. So for students to be able to take point A, point B, point C, point D and look at where their own individual skill sets may lend into that is kind of hand in hand with what we're doing here. So we do have some students that do the video game creation program. They go in, they do a bit of art, they get into traditional, they get into some animation. And that's why having, having the exposure to the different teachers coming in is of such value. Um, because I look at what even some of our students are doing in the animation course. I wasn't able to do at age 23 what some of these students are doing at age 12 and my heart is so warmed and that's really what we're doing here is being able to give the children these skills and giving them the time and the attention to be able to do them now because they don't have anything else to worry about other than creating when they're in the space, which I think is so good. It's good for them. And I think it's important that they don't have to be a master of these skills, but it's a, such a benefit to be introduced to it and be able to practice it and maybe be able to find talents that they may not have known they've had. Absolutely. There, there are times where uh, we will pick up different materials and even I'm reminded, I go, oh, I remember I used to really do, like to do this when I was nine. And when you can introduce something show them something and then bring them through and say actually this ties into the Fibonacci square and then all of a sudden we start talking about math or science and it's just such a healthy confidence building. There's a bit of spontaneity but there's also um, working with them on where their skills are and what they're working on at the time. So sometimes it's a palette knife, the next minute we're using a tablet, the next minute we're doing Photoshop. So there's any number of things that I find uh, that are going to engage them and, and allow them to work through and forward with what, what they're doing. I think it's just uh, fantastic that you're, you're teaching, you're inspiring, you're helping to shape the future of this industry, if not, you know, help shape the lives of, of people who just want to be creative and express themselves. I want to thank you so much for having us here and being on the show. And thanks for what you're doing here at Sassy Tuna. And thank you, Greg, very much for coming by. <laughs> much appreciated. Thanks. Thanks. That was excellent, Julie. Thanks for having us down at Sassy Tuna Studio. Make sure you log in to sassytuna.com and see what they've got going on. And next up, it's our member spotlight. Let's go hang with John Lamb. Hey folks, we're here with John Lamb of John Lamb Illustration and also senior artist at Other Ocean. Uh, thanks for being on the show and bringing us here. Yeah, no problem, Greg. Now, you are doing a lot of um, traditional, your, your own artwork. I'm not sure if it's traditional, you can tell us that. Uh, and you're doing a lot of you know, more digital uh, artwork at Other Ocean in your career. What led up to the point where you are now? What's your background in, in art? Uh, so in uh, 2006, I graduated the art and animation program at NBCC Miramichi, so that was in New Brunswick. I had originally wanted to follow my brother's footsteps. He, he's a, he was an animator, now he's a character designer. Um, after realizing that someone in my family could like go out and become an artist and, and do it super well, um, I decided to pursue that as well for myself. So. Um, I spent uh, a number of years um, being an animator, doing a lot of different animation for a lot of different companies, YTV, uh, Cartoon Network. Um, and then after that, I spent about a six month period wondering if I wanted to like 
um, become migratory and basically move from where I was to to another province. I kind of puttered around for a while and um, uh, reassessed, uh, you know, what it was that I wanted to do. Uh, but the thing was, is at the time I actually had no 3D experience whatsoever. Oh. Yeah. So. Um, and I was kind of a bit worried about that because my whole forte was mostly around, you know, a particular slice of animation. But the cool part about that, though, was the fact that uh, it kind of, it awakened in me something that I didn't really expect, and that's um, a love of, like, learning different types of technology and expanding my horizons as well, too. I've been with Other Ocean for about 10 years now. Um, most recently, I'd say probably the past four or five years, I kind of switched my passion over because I was doing a lot of, you know, stuff at night, doing, you know, different paintings and things along those lines um, for my own personal work. Um, you happen to be in a, in a creative industry that is based on innovation. Yeah. So would you kind of suggest that, you know, your, your new line of artwork that you're working on personally mm -hmm. is that's where that pushing the envelope comes in is you're trying to take those ideas that yeah. are occurring in your day job in a way and pushing it into your personal work? Uh, very much so. So um, originally the first group of pieces that I did were based off of the art style we had used for Giant Cop, which was a game that Other Ocean released um, roughly around the same time in 2017. Um, we use that art style specifically so that that way the game could run on a, in virtual reality and that's mostly because of the fact that at the time VR wasn't that powerful, it couldn't handle doing really complex things like it can nowadays. And I really enjoyed that style myself so I took that forward and used it in my own personal work because uh, I was doing it on a daily basis. It was something I was super comfortable with but it was also something that I could take and abstract and kind of push and um, you know do different things. And then the most recent set of artworks that I've done uh, all come from the style that I use on Project Winter, which is the, the game that we're currently working on right now. Winter's art style is very much like using that, uh, you know, low poly triangulated simplistic style, but also adding some more elements on top of it to make it, you know, bring it more so towards something that's almost like storybook-esque. Um, and that's really what I found super interesting about it in terms of core concepts. So I used uh, that um, same style to then approach what I had done recently and the results were really good. So that's a, that's cool the, the way you can take that that process sort of the technical process and apply it to art that to some might feel like traditional art and I noticed that with your with your new line of, of prints that um, there's a lot of uh, Newfoundland culture there there's a lot of jelly bean houses and harbor shots and everything when you grow up around here you take those things for granted because it's just another piece of scenery to you but if you leave and then come back there's almost like this sparkly new appeal to it. You notice things that you didn't see previously and you realize that like a lot of your roots are based in this, this type of thing. So it's me trying to give back to the culture that um, I grew up with and show my appreciation for it. Those row houses are very much indicative of a, of a particular time period, but they also, you know, they're so wild and colorful and you see that you don't really see that anywhere else in the world, right? Going back to, you know, how you got into this and you, you went to school for art, you, already, you obviously had passion and talent for it. Um, and you said it was, it was kind of unique coming into the 3D world or, or game development because you hadn't done that. Do you think those foundations, those artistic foundations you had, made that leap a lot more adaptable. Like, oh, how yeah. important are those artistic foundations to somebody wanting to get into the oh. game development art world? I would 1000% suggest going and doing a traditional fine art course. So, um, I was lucky enough uh, when I did the art and animation course that the first year was literally just called Art Fundamentals. Core fundamentals are what gets you to the next point to be able to do those things comfortably. So unless you have those or you know want to have those, that's a really important thing as well too. So it, it's uh, that core art um, training is definitely what got me here in the first place. I enjoy being able to represent something, but at the same time having like uh, taking doing a different take on it. Um, you know, pushing it to a place where people would would not have normally thought that that could be or come from. Um, and the other thing as well too is like I really enjoy simplification. I love complex things and diving into complex things, but I also like a really nice simple image as well too. So that was kind of the where all this new land art stuff came from in the first place. Um, the newest group of pieces that I've done recently, which was about uh, five months ago, are more so a blending of a traditional style um, or a more realistic style with the style that I had had previously because I wanted to try and prove to myself that like you can create something that um, 
ticks all the boxes in terms of you know how you would approach a fine art piece but at the same time also have like also use and and um, you know, really make use of, of 3D and uh, the potential and the power for it. When I had started at Other Ocean, like I had said, it was such a heavily used skill set. I, you know, learned on the fly, but at the same time, I like fell in love with it. And, oh, good. And it looks beautiful on the wall too. You know, it's uh, you put this process into it, some technical aspects, some some heart from from being here, and it just looks it looks amazing. They're, they're really good work. Well, the the thing is, is like, and what I always enjoy as well too is like I was really big into uh, Lego and set building. I was the guy who built the sets in in drama class in high school, so uh, it's very much a natural extension of you know where I, I had come from. But uh, that's what the the attraction to 3D for me as well too is that I can have this thing, it exists in, in this three dimensional space so I can change the lighting, I can reorient things, I can bend them, I can twist them, like I can change it so that it's it's its own unique thing but then it can also be an iterative thing. I could do this version, uh, I could do a day version, I could do a night version and it, it all kind of like stems from the fact that I spent the work on physically building this little set piece but then it becomes a hundred different pieces of artwork, which is why I think it's so powerful. It's just because of the fact that like, you know, digital 3D, all that stuff is a tool, but it's a tool as a gateway that, it, that enables you to be able to do so much more with what you're doing. This, is, uh, this has really been a, a great chat and I want to thank you for being on our show and bringing us into your world and showing us your art, which is for sale, I think, right? You can buy your art. We'll include some links in the, in the description and everything. And I just want to thank you very much for, for sharing with us. No problem, Greg. Thank All you right. very much for having me on. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Thanks, John. We're going to keep an eye on what you create next. That's a wrap, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to include all the links you need down in the description. Until next time, game on.